I'm opening a Juno risk and the opening screen comes up. I'm going to create a new model. I'm going to select this create a new node. This is a discrete node icon. And the properties, we're going to call this disease. I'll leave it as Boolean. I'm just going to make this screen, make this a bit bigger. And I'm also going to make the font size bigger. So first I'm going to define the probability table for this node. And we said that there's a one in a thousand chance it's true and 999 out of a thousand times it's false. So when I apply this, it will normalize it to sum to one. And when I just run the model here, you'll see it sets it. Now it's not showing the true value because that's something that we can change in the properties, how many decimal points we want. So we'll go into model graph properties. I'm going to make the minimum value displayed much smaller. So let's make sure that we get all the decimal points. Let's put five in there. And now you can see it's displaying the value 0.1, which is one in a thousand. I'm now going to define the test node. Go into properties, which I do by right clicking. So this is test result. I'll keep it as Boolean. I could have made it label, it doesn't matter, but in the node states, I'm going to customize that. So the positive outcome, I'm going to call positive and the negative outcome, I'll call negative. I'm now going to create the dependency from disease to test result. And I'm going to define the probability table for the test result. And this says if the disease is true, what's the probability to get a positive test result? Well, that was 99%, so we we'll put 99, leave that as one. If we haven't got disease, the probability of a positive test result, I have false positive was 5%. So we put, if we put five there and 95 there, and we apply that, we get the correct probability table for the test accuracy. And now I can run the model. And if I double click, double clicking on the node switches it between the graph display and the node name. Now it's already done a calculation here that wasn't obvious. It's already worked out that even before we do any test, the probability that someone will test positive is just over 5% because it's taken account of the prior probability for the disease and the associated probabilities of getting a positive result, both when the disease is true and not true. But of course, we're interested now in running the model with forward and backward inference. So obviously, if we enter the observation true here and run the model, then because we encoded the probability table for the test result this way, it's 99% probability that it'll be positive if we've got the disease. And of course, if we haven't got disease, this should be 5% positive probability, which of course is exactly what we expect. So we'll clear the observation, run the model back to its original state. And of course, the interesting thing is the Bayes theorem calculation, which is the backward inference. So when we observe a positive result and run the model, we now get that probability that we have the disease and you see it's 1.943, etc. So it's just a bit under 2%. If we observe a negative test result, the probability we've got the disease is now incredibly low, 0.00105%. A simple Bayesian network with just two nodes. But of course, things can get more complex than that. Where the power of the Bayesian network really comes into its own is with more complex models. So let's suppose that we've got two independent tests. So we're going to now consider the possibility of testing somebody twice with two independent tests. So what we want to do here is create a copy of this node, which we can do by simply doing that. If we look at the node probability table for the copied node, it's got exactly the same node probability table as the original test result. So there's nothing we need to do here. So that's our second test result. I'm going to clear all the observations, which I can do up there rather than doing them individually. Set the model back to its prior state. So we've now got two independent tests. If the first test is positive, 
then look what happens here. Of course, we get the result that we had before. We've only had one test, but it's now updated the probability that we've got the disease. That, because that's increased, the probability that the second test result will be positive has gone up. It's gone up to 6.8%. So if we do a second test and that one's positive, then we're now at 28% probability that we've got the disease. I could actually add another copy of that. Then with three independent tests, all positive, it's very likely that we're gonna have the disease. So I'm gonna rename that. I'm gonna remove the observations. Let's just set it back to the original. So of course, it handles conflicting evidence. So if you've got one positive result and you follow that by a negative result, that's decreased from the original prior of 0.1%. If you've got a two positives and one negative, that single negative is keeping this probability quite low. It's higher than the original prior of 0.1%, but it's still pretty low. So again, let's remove all these observations. What I'm now gonna do is create another model here. Because this time round, let's just, I'm gonna copy, I only need these two. I'm going to copy and paste. So I'm going to call this dependent tests. Because what I'm going to do now is introduce dependency between the first and the second test result. So in this case, the assumption is that these aren't necessarily independent. It could be that the person looking at the second test result has already seen the first test result and therefore is subject to confirmation bias or it could be that the sample on the first test result is also used on the second test result. There could be any number of reasons for that dependency. So we have to redefine this probability table here. If the person has the disease and the first test is positive, so it gave the correct result, what's the probability that the second test will be positive. Well, because of the confirmation bias, there's going to be a greater probability than on the first test result. So the first test result had a 99% probability. Let's suppose this is 99.5. So that's just the same as 995 and 5. That will normalize. If the first test result incorrectly gave a negative result, then that 99% probability of getting it correct on the second result might come down. Again, because of confirmation bias, we're less likely to give the correct positive result here. So that might come down to 90%, which is the same as 9 and 1. If a person hasn't got the disease and the first test result gave a false positive, then it's even more likely to get a false positive next time round. So initially the false positive was 5%. So this might increase, for example, to as much as 15%. Because the first test said it was positive, the second test, given that dependency, is more likely than the first test to have got it wrong as well. If the first test correctly says that it's negative, then that 5% false positive probability might go down to say 3% this time. So we've now defined a new conditional probability table to take account of the dependency with, due to things like confirmation bias. When we run the model, this part of it doesn't change, it's the same as it was before, but this second test result, the probability that that's gonna be positive, that has now changed because of that dependency. So for example, if we observe a positive test result first time round, then the probability that that is gonna be positive increases. And consequently, if we do observe a positive result here, the probability of having the disease, of course, has increased. It's now 11%, but that's not as great as it was with the independent test. Let's just remind ourselves here. So when there were two positive independent test results, the probability of having disease was 28%. Here it's only 11.6%. This also stresses the importance of having independent confirmatory testing. I'm now going to create another model and I'm gonna again copy what we had in here. I'm gonna copy that into here. This time round, 
I'm going to consider a case where there's possibly a systematic cause of errors in the different testing. So although the tests themselves are independent, there's no dependency between them, there might be some systematic reason why the test results are more inaccurate than normal. So I'm going to create a new node here. I'm going to define the probability table for this to be unlikely we get a systematic error. And in this case, the assumption is that even though these are independent, there might be a systematic error causing both of these to be flawed. Such as, for example, if there is faulty equipment, the way the sampling was done, anything like that. And so in this case, the way I'm going to define this is that if there's no systematic error, then the probabilities are going to be exactly as they were before. So if there's no systematic error and we don't have the disease, then the probability of false positive, remember, was 5%. So we've got 5 and 95 as before here. If we have got the disease and there's no systematic error, then the probability of a true positive is 99% and 1 as before. But if there is systematic error, so here and here, then irrespective of the disease state, I'm going to assume that just as likely we'll get a negative as a positive. So it really doesn't tell us anything at all in the case where we've got a systematic error. So I'll apply that. And of course, I want the same probability table here. So I'm simply going to take that probability table. I'll, I'll do a copy and paste on that by simply doing a control C. Going into here selecting this and doing a control V, paste that table into there. I run the model. Because of the small probability of a systematic error, we've now got a difference in the, the prior marginal probability of a positive test result. Just to check this, if we know that there's no systematic error, then the result here is exactly the same as where we had the independent tests. But allowing for the possibility of a systematic error, let's suppose that we observe a positive test result. Now what's happened in this case is that the probability is not as high as it would have been with the results without the systematic error. And that's because observing a positive test result has actually increased our belief in the probability of systematic error. Because positive test results are quite rare in the normal case, and they're more likely when there's systematic error because that's the way we defined systematic error was, was equally, if we did have one, it's equally likely to get a positive as a negative test result. So that's increased that probability, which means that the posterior probability of disease isn't as high as it was in the single case here. Remember? If we get a second positive test result, that's pushed up the probability of systematic error even higher, which means, again, we're not as confident in the probability that the person has the disease. The Bayesian inference that's going on here, even for a relatively small model like this, is really difficult to do by hand. It's, it's, you have to have a tool to do the Bayesian inference correctly here. 